Welcome back to Inclusive Leadership. Just a reminder that this class is designed with three goals in mind. Number one, develop students' individual approach to change making and leadership. Two, develop empathy. And three, develop problem solving skills. And each week we take a look at either a skill or a system. And this week and for the next couple of weeks, we're going to be focusing on the voting rights system in our country. And we're going to take a look at some of the history and some of the issues that we're dealing with today as it relates to voting rights and what impedes those rights. So just to give you all an overview, for the next few weeks, uh, we're going to look at voting rights um, as a movement and all the systems that have affected voting rights, because there are multiple systems that have affected voting rights throughout history in the United States. So as we enter into this topic, we will take time to deep dive into the background of the voting rights movement in America. Um, we'll look at the Voting Rights Act of 1965 and how that changed everything, um, and all the events that surrounded it in Selma, Alabama, as well as the current challenges affecting voting rights today. So these are some questions I want you to think about as we are going through this material over the next few weeks. These aren't necessarily questions I want you to answer right away in your journal or anything like that. These are just questions that I want to guide um, your thought process as we learn more about voting rights. First question is, does voting matter? Why were black citizens throughout the South ready to risk their lives to secure their right to vote? Okay. And then I want you to consider what are some reasons people don't or can't exercise their right to vote today. And you might have to think about different people groups that are affected by a lack of access to vote today. People that live in the United States that cannot vote today. Um, number three, what is significant about the right to vote? In what ways have students made a difference in the right to vote historically and what can they do today? Number four, I want you to think about what does it take to solve and heal deeply ingrained injustice? Meaning injustice that has been a part of the fabric um, of, the, of an organization, of um, a nation, of, of even, you know, we'll talk a little bit about the difference between um, laws that are instituted by a state and by the federal government and how those interact together. Um, so what does it take to solve and heal injustice that is deeply woven into the fabric of a society? Um, or a group or a business, anything like that. Number five, is the right to vote still secure? How might current campaigns in the United States learn from Selma and its aftermath? Okay, so those are just a few guiding questions for you to consider as you're working through this voting rights material and as we work through it together on Microsoft Teams. So right now I want you to pause and I want you to go navigate to Microsoft Teams. I want you to open up your Microsoft Teams journal. And I want you to think about race and racism as it relates to your life. Because what we find as we discover more and more about the voting rights movement in the United States is how deeply ingrained and tied it is to race, um, the construct of race and racism in America. And so before we can examine racism in America and um, race itself, we have to understand how it relates to us personally. Race and racism isn't something that's in the past. It's actually something that's very um, prevalent today. Racism in, in and of itself and the construct of race. Uh, many folks, um, whether you're a person of color or you're a person, a white person um, who experiences privilege on a regular basis, race influences who you are and how you operate in the world um, and what you do or do not have access to. And so until we understand how race and racism affect us as individuals, and we can't possibly understand how it's affecting systems and how it has affected systems over time. So the questions I want you to answer in your journal are one, how does race influence who I am? Number two, how are my experiences similar to and different from those of people from other racial backgrounds? Okay, and then I want you to also consider what kinds of bias and privilege do individuals and groups experience because of their race? And that can be uh, in history or currently. And number four, I want to know what can we do to address racial prejudice and advocate for racial justice? And I don't want you to answer that necessarily um, as a, in a group or communal context. Um, I know it's using the word we. But I, I want you to think about yourself. What are some ways that you can contribute uh, to addressing 
racial prejudice? And, and what are some ways that you individually can be an advocate for racial justice in your realm of influence, in the spaces that you carry influence? Welcome back. I hope you're able to answer all five of those questions. So what we know to start off in terms of voting rights is that the Iroquois Confederacy, um, founded in 1142, is the oldest living participatory democracy on Earth in what would become the Northeast United States. Um, so this confederacy existed in Northern America, um, somewhere around the New York, New Hampshire area. So some elements of the Iroquois Great Law of Peace would then influence the creation of the United States as a constitutional republic in 1787. The United States then adopts a franchise model. So think about like Little Caesars, for example. You'll notice that they might be all over the Tacoma area, but they're not all owned by the same individual. So a franchise model just means that individuals can operate their particular store the way that they want to um, underneath the authority of the person that owns the franchise in and of itself. Um, so essentially giving those um, business owners a little bit more agency and flexibility as it relates to running their store in their particular city. So when you adopt a franchise model in a government, that means that states have the opportunity to create their own laws and regulations. Thus, the U.S. Con Constitution left it to states to decide who had the right to vote. So we'll get started with a timeline of the voting rights movement. So around the time of the Constitution of the United States in 1787, the people that had the right to vote were property-owning, white, and male. Okay? And there were a couple of brief changes in between there um, and the next major decision in 1861. Uh, there was a brief moment of, and period of time where women, um, white property owning women, had the right to vote in New Jersey in, uh, up until 1807. Um, and then also free black men in North Carolina that owned property uh, were allowed to vote until 1835. So those are a couple um, of brief changes, but both of those were also uh, in 1807 and 1835. Um, th those were uh, shut down, uh, essentially, and those those people no longer had the right to vote. So then uh, we experience a nationwide war uh, where the North and the South are battling over a number of things, but slavery being one of them. And in 1861, after the North wins the Civil War, um, there are three amendments put into place, and, and we'll talk about those. Um, but in 1861, then, um, white males were allowed to vote, and some black males in northern states owning $250 worth of property were allowed to vote. And that's pre-amendment, okay? Um, and then in 1867, post-Civil War, okay, we've now, uh, the Civil War has been won by the North, the, amend the three amendments, the 13th, the 14th, and the 15th, have been put into place. Slavery is outlawed. And now black and white males have the right to vote. Uh, so in 1861, you'll notice the only thing gone uh, was, well, a, a, a few black males were allowed to vote, but uh, now white males were allowed to vote that didn't own property. In 1867, black and white men were allowed to vote, whether they owned property or not. But we still don't include women during this time. So during this period of Reconstruction is when uh, black and black folks uh, that were coming out of slavery are now uh, allowed to run for office. Uh, they're allowed to vote, um, and we see that the federal government exists in the South in order to make sure that black people are able to fully live um, in the rights that they have now earned. Uh, and so then uh, we enter into a time several several years later. From 1877 to 1965, we have what's known as the Jim Crow era. And during this time, the folks that had the right to vote were black and white men. And then in 1920, women, which included some black women, but was mostly white women. Um, and that was according to the 19th Amendment. But you'll notice there's a little star right there, and that is to indicate that even though black men had the right to vote, 
they were systematically removed from that right to vote through uh, various different means. And we'll talk a little bit more about what that looks like. So right now I want you to take a pause and I want you to think about the three amendments that I just mentioned. And I want you to go uh, onto Microsoft Teams and there's a handout there called the History of Voting Rights After 1865. And on that, it outlines the Reconstruction Amendments, the 13th, the 14th, and the 15th Amendment. And I want you to respond to these questions in your journal. Number one, what does each amendment say? Two, how does each amendment change the Constitution? Number three, why was each amendment enacted? Why is each important? And what rights does each guarantee to Americans of African descent? Number four, what provisions does each amendment make for enforcement of its guarantees? Who has the power to enforce the amendment and how? So go ahead and take some time to answer those questions in your journal. All right, welcome back. So we're gonna continue on with our timeline and we're gonna go a little bit more in depth and just talk about what happened as a result of uh, th those individuals having the right to vote. So in 1867, Reconstruction begins and this is post-Civil War um, for the most part. And uh, at this time, uh, black men are now able to vote and also able to run for office. And so we see 2000 plus black men are elected to public office. In addition, black men were able to help rewrite state constitutions, and 16 black men were elected to the United States Congress representing southern states. That's a really big deal. So in 1877, so about 10 years later, we see the end of Reconstruction. And so if you consider the idea of Reconstruction is that uh, military members from the North were living in the South in order to make sure that African Americans had access to all of their rights, including the right to vote. Then when the federal government removes those troops, those Northern troops from the South, then that doesn't ensure that those rights will still be maintained. And honestly, 10 years isn't a long enough time for healing to take place. Um, and for those that didn't believe that um, African Americans deserved those rights, they weren't really bought into that. They weren't really bought into that. And so the federal government removed rights protections. Okay, so they took their troops out of the South. And that meant that white supremacists and ex-Confederates, meaning um, Southern soldiers, used a combination of means to reestablish their power and dominance in the South, including violence, intimidation, and legal barriers. So between then 1877 and 1896, we still see that um, elections are able to take place. So amidst violence, intimidation, and legal barriers, six African-American men from the South were elected to U.S. Congress between 1877 and 1901. So that's a huge victory, even amidst all of these barriers. But then um, in 1896, the Supreme Court um, approved segregation, which meant um, that after the case of Plessy versus Ferguson, when it ruled separate facilities were legal as, lo as long as they were equal. That means that African Americans were no longer allowed to go to school with white folks um, and use the same water fountains and visit the same restaurants and stores and all of these pieces um, as long as they were equal. I put that in quotation marks. Uh, you can't see me, but I'm putting it in quotation marks because in practice, separate was rarely equal. And so then from 1896 on, um, Jim Crow practices remained in place. And so we see then the rollback of voting rights in southern states with the support of the Supreme Court in decisions such as the 1868 decision um, to remove, uh, so disenfranchisement means to remove voting rights from felons, no longer allowing them to vote even after they've served their time. And some, of, some states still uh, have laws that require uh, you never have committed a felony in order to vote, even if you have served your time. In addition to that, elaborate regulations limited voting for African Americans. So 
literacy and civic testing and poll taxes, among other things, didn't allow African Americans the right to vote or made it extremely hard for them. And even if they could do all those things, remember, there's still violence and intimidation on the other side of that, that they're experiencing from the public. Because, for example, some folks would have their names published in the newspaper if they were trying to have access to the right to vote. And then they would be, um, they would be intimidated publicly. Uh, they would have a lack of access to jobs and other resources. Um, and so it would affect them from an economic standpoint. Um, during the time of Jim Crow practices, though, um, there were organizations like the NAACP, the Communist Party USA, the Dallas County Voters League, um, and many other organizations that were attempting to resist these strategies and get African Americans registered to vote. So we just scratched the very surface of this voting rights movement in the United States over the last several hundred years. And so now I want you to go to https colon forward slash forward slash www.selmaonline.org forward slash chapter dash one forward slash. And I want you to complete chapters one and two. And this is going to take you a little bit deeper into some of the things that we just talked about. So consider we just, we just reviewed the thousand foot view and I want you to take a closer look. And so go ahead and complete chapters one and two and then come back. All right, well now that you've completed chapters one and two, good job. Now I'd like you to listen to a speech that was given by Fannie Lou Hamer at the 1964 Democratic National Convention. And I want you to respond to these questions on posts um, in Microsoft Teams. And just a trigger warning, um, she does provide some detailed descriptions of violence that she experienced in addition uh, to the, some language that might make you uncomfortable but it is the reality, it is truth, and it is history that we have got to build upon as leaders. Um, so these are the questions that I'd like you to answer after listening to Ms. Hamer's story. I want you to share what did you observe? And then I want you to share how do you think people felt as she was sharing her story? How do you think she felt, sorry, um, while she was sharing her story in front of so many white people who had power? And then number three, I'd like you to answer the, this final question. If you could take one thing away from Ms. Hamer's lived experience as it relates to voting rights, what would be your main takeaway? All right, that's where we finish up, folks. I want to thank you so much for listening today and learning today and being willing to engage. And I'll see you next week.